and it looks like he's already started to share his screen. So um, welcome, Mike, and uh, please, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, um, Kevin. I'm trusting you can hear me all fine. Um, so yes, we can. For the um, introduction, I'm not actually a professor, though, Kevin. Um, associate professor, but I, des I certainly deserve to be a professor, so I'm pleased that you promoted me. Um, it's a real, um, first of all, I really wish I was there. I've been having um, terrible FOMO all um, week, and it was a wonderful, um, it was a wonderful program that I was able to actually be there for the whole time. So I really enjoyed that um, so much. It's quite hard for me to believe that five years have passed since then. I'm not quite sure how that's possible. It's a bigger mystery than any of the science we've got to deal with, but somehow the time's passed. And of course, we would have been meeting um, earlier if it hadn't been for COVID. So I suppose it's, and it's been, thanks to the organizers for making sure, and to the INI for making sure that this all happened. So this is um, research that I did when I was in the Isaac Newton Institute or motivated by that um, program. So it's not necessarily what um, we've learned in the last five years, but what we learned in the program. Okay, so it's all about this um, wave propagation through the marginal life zone and about the loss of energy. So this is a huge um, problem. So I guess the thing that's really important to understand is that we don't know where all this energy is going, what the mechanism is that takes it away. We know that it goes to heat somehow. We don't know what is the mechanism. It's, and there's a lot of possible mechanisms that we can, can be proposed. It could be something to do with friction. It could be a boundary layer. It could be the viscosity in the ice. It could be a whole lot of things that we don't know what that physics is. It's an interesting question to go, What's striking to me about it is that, you know, the not knowing something, the longer you go not knowing it, the more it becomes a kind of profounder mystery. I think that's just the nature of what, a, what constitutes a mystery. If you think about any good mystery, people have pondered it for a while. It wasn't like they were a bit confused for five minutes and then they solved it. That doesn't make a great mystery story. So there was a lot of people are interested in waves and how far they go into the ice. And there was a massive push to implement wave ice physics into wave watch. And there was a lot of different explanations put forward and some of which were not um, very useful or very accurate or validated. And in fact, it was quite unhelpful, I suspect, that they got put in there in quite such a rush. But we, that's to be debated. I guess they got put in there and the people were able to show that they didn't work. But certainly, we need to have a conversation about the fact that we don't know this and that we don't know what the physics is. We need to be honest about that in this wave ice community. And um, I think that would just be really helpful. So this is the slide. I, I, this is why it's fuzzy. As I did a, a screen grab from my talk, you can see the date here, I and I, October 2017. So I, I mean, you get to a certain age. Um, you know, one of the speakers was discussing about, you know, your past being behind you, your glory being behind you, but you start to do the same talk five years later. It's not excusable when you're 20, but when you're in your 50s, it's perfectly normal. So, and I think it really is an elephant in the room because nobody wants to mention it. Nobody said, we don't know. It's a huge mystery. And I don't think that's necessarily helpful. Like it, if somebody said, write down the 10 biggest mysteries in geophysics of the planet Earth, and they said, we want you to write in, we want you to nominate a topic, I would write this in, I'd send it in to these guys. So, you know, I'm not saying it's the most important, but I'm thinking maybe it's in the top 10. And if it continues to go unsolved for, for another 10 years, it might be starting to get in the top five. If it gets unsolved for 50 years, it might be in the top. It's, it's, it's an unsolved, it's a mystery, it's a big mystery in geophysics about what is the physics that's removing the energy from the waves. The waves, the energy is disappearing. Nobody's under any illusion about that. It's, it's clearly happening, but we don't know what it is. And of course, the problem is if you don't have any physics, then you don't have a lot of mass. You certainly can have some, that's very untrue. You can have some amazing mass and some very beautiful mathematics, some of which I'll even show you, but you don't necessarily have the, um, 
you don't you, you, you might land on the correct answer so in the context of all of this problem of trying to work it out when i was in the isaac newton institute i, I did do a bit of thinking about this problem and i had some time to um, work through it and i wrote a one paper in the journal of geophysical research with a number of co-authors who all contributed to it and I'm going to describe that research and what I tried to work out. So just before we get started, um, and this is maybe not super important, but when we talk about, sorry, there's one thing I wanted to say before I got started, which I've completely forgotten to say, like the most important thing, which is that when I signed up for this, I signed up to give a 45 minute talk. I'm no, not quite sure why. I must have thought I was much cleverer than I am. And then I was intending to come. It was entirely my intention to be there. And I got as far as the university booking system was an absolute nightmare. And by the time I'd gone through and got the vice chancellor and his assistant to sign off on forms and get to book the tickets, it was $5,000 and I was just could not afford to come. So I don't intend to speak for 45 minutes. It's not my intention at all. I'm gonna to aim to go for 30 minutes. And which is which is what the time I should have said. I've just downgraded myself to a thirty-minute talk. I'm so apologise to everyone, but um, be able to have a slightly earlier break, a longer coffee break, where you can um, ask me questions or you can do whatever. All right. So if I was there, maybe I'd bang on. But if I if I keep um, talking, telling stories about the trouble of booking tickets, I might still be going for forty-five minutes. All right. So we've got this thing with decay can be written in terms of energy, which is sort of standard, and that's what all the experimentalists did, and that's what I did. But it's actually much better to write it in terms of the amplitude and to think about the decay as being an imaginary part of the wave number. And that's actually become quite popular as a way to do it. And there's a very simple relationship between them where the imaginary part of K is that. So I just thought I mentioned that amplitude is definitely better. It's certainly not something that I worked out myself, but I've just noticed it and over, over the, the time. And I know that um, other people were using this before me, that's for sure. So we want to think, when, we, when the waves start to propagate, this makes perfect sense. I mean, the wave number itself is sort of a mystical creature, isn't it? Right, we really have wavelengths and we're in periods, we've got the silly omega thing, but mathematically it's much better to have an imaginary part of the wave number. As it propagates into the ice, it develops as an imaginary part. And that fits perfectly with, electromagnetic waves moving through plasmas and all this kind of stuff. So this, what I started out with was all the measurements that I had and could get my hands on. I mean, one of them, I've said mainly now, but it wasn't my measurements, it was Alison Coop's measurements. I just I was the first author on one paper that analyzed them. So, um, but that, this refers to the papers and you can plot them up like this and sort of the middle line is supposed to show you the decay with wave, it's a function of wave period, but it's a, massive amount of scatter in all these data. This is actually the least scattered. These were the measurements that were funded by the US Navy in that um, ST state program. These actually look really great. Like, and that, so that, that, that's kind of remarkable. So, and they go right down to this low frequency. So that's, so we've sort of got all this data and it's very messy. That's one of the things to say. And I'm gonna take that data and I'm gonna plot it. This is just to be honest, which is maybe um, a good idea. So I'm going to ignore all of scatter and I'm just going to plot the average, a whole lot of averaging is done. And I put it on this figure here and you can see that this is on um, log log scale. So it's supposed to reveal a power law. This fits incredibly well to a power law. Other ones of them scatter and the slopes vary a little bit, but the slope of this power law is around two and three. And there's been some discussion that wasn't, it's not controversial to do a power law now, but it was sort of starting to try and be the way to analyze them to say, hey, the, the experiments have this power law dependency. And the question then is, what physics would drive this power law? So if you've got a power law, um, you've got a power law dependence like this, what would the physics, what could the physics, could this tell us anything about the possible physical mechanisms that could drive this process? That's my sort of, that was what I thought. And I thought I could go away and start coming up with every type of process and derive the power law myself. So that was a motivation from here. Like how does this power law arise? Why would it be a power law? What kind of mechanism would drive that? So, 
just a little bit of an aside here about the way these words attenuation, scattering, and dissipation, because they're poorly defined. Um, and we'll come back to scattering in a, in a, as a process in a minute uh, at the end of the talk. But attenuation is the decrease in the wave height as it propagates through the marginalized zone. So it's it's just, it might be um, caused by a whole lot of processes. One of the things it could be is just that the waves are getting scattered and they're bouncing back out. They can't get in. Okay, it's a pretty well established process and lots of wave scattering um, things have this property. I mean, just, just the waves bounce around randomly, they're gonna come out, not the chance of them penetrating on their random walk far in is not high. And then, so that's scattering and scattering is a process, to me is the process of changing the direction of propagation that can go backwards or sideways without removing energy and dissipation is the process that removes energy. So both scattering and dissipation can lead to attenuation. So that's how I'm going to use the terms. I mean, it's not, I'm not sure that's a dictionary definition, but it's kind of important to understand that there's these different possible processes. And one of the questions is, what is the role of scattering? I've spent my life studying it, but is it really important? All right. And then I've written down, it's possible that scattering only plays a significant role in the active breaking region. It's possible scattering plays no significant role, but that's sort of maybe saying it, um, but I think it does play a role somewhere. All right. So we start out with the, the most important thing is, is we start out with the dispersion relation in deep water. And we say that the waves are going to propagate into this icy region without very much change to that dispersion relation. So that's going to dominate. So there's going to be some shift in the wave number. So we're going to get, um, I'm going to try and annotate here, it's a bit dangerous, but I brought my pad with me, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, here we go. So I've got a great color as well, so this is going to really improve my talk. I'm going to get my pad out. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to say that that's going to, we're going to write plus some delta K. So we're going to have, um, we're going to have some change in the wavelength. All right. We're going to have some change in the wavelength delta K, and the delta K is going to be equal to, and it's going to have some real part, which isn't going to be very big, and it's going to have some change in K that's imaginary that's going to give us the dissipation. So that's our idea. It's quite a good one, I think. Think. So it's the wavelength that changes the wave, the real and imaginary part of it, but the real part change, we won't really be able to see because it's quite small. But the um, the real part, the imaginary part is going to be important. And the question is, um, are, is this really true? Is does the wavelength not, is the wavelength in um, open, water is the same as the way experiments that have been conducted by and large show in that, but it's not something that's been measured enough. So that's, that's, that's a thing that, you know, more measurements will be really useful on just seeing if it is changing. And some people have claimed changes, but it's hard to know if it's not caused by some other shift, but you know, there could be all these nonlinear effects and everything else. So there are a whole lot of dispersion relations that have, people have calculated based on physics. And so what people have done is they, um, started out with some physics and they've um, they've taken their physics and then they've done a long process. I'm loving writing with this thing. I'm not sure what it's teaching you. There's a long process from their physics that they've ended up with some equation that looks like this. And it always takes this form where there's some term that modifies the dispersion relation and another term that came from the plate. And this plate term calls it's called total chaos in the um, literature and in Wave Watch and all of the stuff because it, it, it you can fit it's, there's so many parameters that can appear in here you can fit to data and you can get crazy kind of situations where you you kind of get appear to get a fit but you've actually just landed on a crazy branch of this dispersion curve with very unphysical properties so we just get rid of that part of it it's a, it's a bold step but that actually is a good step because you don't want to have some it was a, 
few people sort of proposing models for waves and ice where they had some um, like modeled ice is having a Young's modulus of 10 to the 5,000 or something like that. I'm exaggerating slightly, but it was getting pretty stupid. Um, it, wasn't a, it wasn't anything that existed on planet Earth yet. Okay, so we come down to this much simpler equation and then you can sort of get the idea. We're gonna just calculate the attenuation by looking at the properties of Q and doing an expansion and um, first order expansion, assuming this Q is small. Okay, nothing too clever. You just put K as the wave number plus epsilon times K1. So there's a small change in Q. You substitute it in the dispersion relation and you end up with this um, formula for the attenuation. So basically this allowed me to take anyone's dispersion relation that they'd written down in the literature and work out what the um, Ki was, what the imaginary part of this K is. And one of the things that's really um, app um, apparent immediately when you do the small expansion is that this is gonna end up being a power of K and nor and omega. Maybe I can just go to my magic um, annotator. So not only do you, have you got a way to go straight to the, from the dispersion relation, I can write down straight away what the Ki is going to be, just assuming that the um, effect of the ice is small, but also this is going to be some K naught to the power of nine, omega to the power of 82. But K naught is, of course, omega squared to the, so that's omega squared to the power of 82. You know, K naught, is equal to omega squared over G. So you're gonna end up with some, you're not gonna hopefully end up with omega to the power of 82, but you're gonna get with, up with omega to the end. You're gonna end up with a power law straight out of this. So the data is a power law and all these dispersion relations are a power law. So that's, that's kind of cool. So maybe these power laws are real. Um, and you know, of course they're not gonna be real, are they? They're gonna, but they might be a good model. They might be a good model. So um, now the next part of this talk is a little bit dodgy because I spent a, it's one of those things I spent a hell of a long time thinking about and um, I was in Cambridge and didn't have a lot else to do except to go to the Pickerel, which I hope you guys have all been going to. It's, it's my favorite um, drinking place in Cambridge, it's down by the um, river. So I did all this work and I came up with what I thought was a brilliant idea. But when I looked at it, when I was preparing this talk, which was happened to my little dot above the eye here, it was added in. Um, when I was preparing this talk, I realized that, you know, sometimes you say I wrote this paper and I was the only one who understood it. But unfortunately, this is even worse. It's I wrote this paper and no one understood it because I've forgotten what I did. And I'm not sure it, I can claim now looking back after five years that I understand it. But I can try and give you an idea if you ever did want to understand it. I can give you a roadmap that might help you to understand it from sort of a vague place um, looking back. So what you do is you say, well, the waves propagating along and the ice is only having a small effect. This is the effect of the ice. So it's perturbing it and we're gonna say it's order epsilon, which is, we've done that already and we've got a power law. So that was a great idea, wasn't it? And it agreed with the data. So this seems like a really, seems a sensible thing to do. And then we do the same with the displacement. So we, we've got an expression here for the zeroth order one. And then we plug it into some sort of energy equation. And what happens is the energy is going to, that at order epsilon, we're going to get an interaction between the um, second order and the first order terms. So we can write down something with the energy. All right. So what we do is we write down this expression here. This is a bit I don't understand anymore. But I think my, I can tell you what I think I was trying to do. I was trying to write down some inner product of energy and expanding it in epsilon. And what I, when I did the first order expansion, I got a product of my solution. This is the zeroth order solution, right? Um, here, let me just explain it. This is what I think I was doing, okay? It's making more sense to me now, actually, when I'm giving the talk than it did when I looked at it before. Um, this is just the wave by itself, right? No ice. And then this is the first order interaction and energy. So what it is, it's a product of two terms, right? This is the no ice, and this is the perturbation, right? This is the, the delta bit. 
And then you get another term like that. So that's why I got a two here. So basically this term here represents all the energy that's getting taken out. So every energy extraction, every energy extraction process that you write down. So you can take the physics, this is the idea. You take your physics and you plug it into this formula I derived. Don't worry about what the spirit of energy is. That's just trying to be clever. Um, you end up with this, this inner product, this product of these two terms. This you know, and this is your perturbed term that you're going to derive that's eating up the energy. All right. And then what you can do is apply that to um, um, your, your, our theories to energy. This is just a conversion that gives you this term R, how it compares to the um, Ki. So the energy, the rate of it, which energy is getting eaten by the system, you've got to modify it by the um, root velocity. And you end up with this term here, this normalizes the energy, and this is a propagation time. Not super important, but this is just like a conversion process because you're going from time to space. There isn't anything more to it than that. So this is, this is just how you can basically convert from time to space. Um, there we go. Yeah. So if you imagine um, if you had a whole lot of waves in a bathtub bouncing back and forth, then they would decay as omega to the power of three, say. And if you allow them to propagate along, they'd go as omega to the power of four. You get this model in, in this process of going from dx, from d by dt to d by dx, you get a CG appearing. So that's all this is about. So once we've got our R, we can just basically write down our power law directly from it. All right. So I started out with Keller's model, which is just this horrendous. Um, process here. This is what Keller wrote down. So this is a beautiful um, story. It's been used a lot. And so Keller was something of a genius. He's one of the um, great figures of um, math um, applied mathematics. He did all kinds of stuff. He did, he's famous for doing, most famous for working out the why of um, ponytail bobs side to side when person's running or something like that. Um, and he worked on this ice model forever. I, this is my feeling. I'm maybe making this up. But he, he did a whole lot of work and finally he never quite got to the punchline. So this paper contains a whole lot of stuff, not just this viscous model. But his idea was basically a very complicated way, but you had a viscous layer. And it seems perfectly, this seems the logical place to start. Like all I'm saying, Keller's a genius, but coming up with the idea that ice is a viscous layer probably wasn't that brilliant. And he ended up with his expression here for Q. That's his Q that I see every... Every dispersion relation is a Q. It's a horrendous formula. It's just gone right off the page, but who cares? It's not that important. Um, so we can convert that because we're going to go, hey, hang on, Keller, this ice is small. I want a small layer, and we're going to convert that back to a dispersion relation. So, um, and then there's um, this Q Keller, do a little bit of reduction on it. Um, and then you end up with this, finally you end up with this term here involving this um, viscous parameter that you've got to parameterize all this curve. And it goes as omega to the power of seven. It has a power law of seven. So immediately you go, okay, Keller's way off track here. And one of the things to realize is that, and there's gonna be more than one, should have said this at the start, there's gonna be more than one physics that's causing this um, wave attenuation, right? There's going to be 90, 900 different processes, but there's one that goes as omega to the seven, and then there's one that goes at omega to the power of four. This is going to dominate eventually because, you know, as omega gets big, then this is going to, um, this one here is going to, sorry, omega gets small, this is going to, dis, this is going to get um, rapidly smaller. So it's the lowest power that will dominate anyway. So, but any, so that's another reason why you're unlikely to see powers of seven. But anyway, Keller's model is wrong, okay? So in, in all the models that have come from it, not, it, it hasn't got the right physics in it. And you can see that immediately. So that was... So how do we go... What That other um, strange in the product stuff was the, I'm going to try and explain here, but what it is is you can take the physics of Keller's model, the dispersion relation here, right? So this is, the, this is the pressure condition that he applied, and you can plug it into this energy and you get an expression like that, okay, in terms of this matrix. And that, 
when you so when you plug it into this matrix formulation that I said I don't really understand, so I'm now explaining something I wrote and did at one stage claim to understand. Now I'm sort of confused by it myself. But anyway, it's this, this is a mechanism by which you can place into this energy expression the energy loss mechanism. So you take it, you put it into here, and then you crank the handle of this strange inner product. And you come down and you can put, you can calculate the R and then you can convert by converting the K, right? Divide by the CG. So that K to the four becomes an omega to the eight, but the CG is of, of power omega and you end up with omega to the seven. You end up with Keller's um, just straight from the physics. Don't go through, because this, while this looks horrible and it's a strange notation and what the hell am I banging on about? This is actually way simpler than trying to go through that horrendous thing that Keller did to derive his equations of motion. So it's a little bit like um, you know, using Hamilton's principle to derive the swinging of a pendulum. It's so much easier. So this, uh, other than the fact that no one can understand it, but it leads directly to it. So, so you can just take, you can use this, the, the idea of this in a product thing is you can take the energy loss, plug it in, don't worry about trying to derive some equations and then see what it comes up with and it'll tell you the order of it. So that was cool. And that was a bit of a tool for me because I thought, okay, everything's good now. I've just got to start dreaming up some energy loss mechanisms that'll give me a low power, a power of, of omega to the, that I want. I want R to be omega to the power of say four. It's really interesting here that this, it's quite difficult to come up with a mechanism that will give you an even power in distance. In time, it'll be even, but in distance, it'll be odd. And there's, there's a funny a few reasons for that because generally the energy loss loss mechanism is a, you know energy is a quadratic it's a square of something. All right. So this I'm going to go through this a little bit quicker here because I my God I'm going to be going on to my um, last few. I'm going to be talking for 45 minutes. If I'm not careful. Um, all right. So the viscous Greenhill model was this is basically a plate with viscosity. So this is another model that came up and you crank the handle, it turns out omega to the 11, it's even worse. So this is a terrible idea. And I think this one, I think both of these models have wound their way into um, Wave Watch, but so you can imagine what a disaster this is. It's just dying so quickly. There's no way you can, if you fit to data in one place, you'll be wildly off immediately. Um, and then there's this Robinson Palmer one. Um, Luke mentioned this. So it's, it's completely unphysical in my opinion, but it produces the right um, omega to the three term. So this is, this is a much better model, even if it's not physical, it's a much better model to use. Just notice here that the eta um, is a free parameter in it. So you can just basically, um, you can tune it. So it doesn't really matter that it's not physical because there's no physics in it. You just got, it's just a free parameter that has the right behavior of omega to the three. So this is gonna work really well to eat up the energy, but this is a continuous plate. And we, we, most of the energy is getting eaten up by a broken brash sort of ice. It isn't really, scattering that's eating up the energy. So this model, the physics, I just think is completely wrong here, but anyway, it works because it has the right power and you can see that from deriving it. And it's called Robinson Palmer because these guys wrote a paper about it. They had nothing to do with ice. And then you can put it into my um, little inner product and there's the product there. That's the energy term here. So the energy, the, each, the energy, each of these, two, the, this means that you, the energy is somehow related to the time derivative of the displacement of the plate. It's got nothing to do with the potential. No energy has been eaten up in the fluid. That's what this, this notation means. So I'm use, losing energy as the time derivative of the displacement of the plate. So I, then I can crank the handle and it gives me my R. So I'm, 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 a lot of this is coming back to me in the talk. I've learned a lot. Um, I'm less confused by it. Um, the, I came up, I tried to do one with the order two power law. So this seemed important because we thought there was an order two, but now we've decided it's order three. There was some problem with the data or something. And this is really hard to do. And I kind of fudged it. In fact, if, I pro if I've been aiming for a power three law, I might've actually cracked the problem. But because I wanted to get a power two, I ended up going through this funny one that's somehow a product of the displacement of the plate with the velocity potential displacement, time displacement of the velocity potential. So this is a product of the plate moving and the velocity of the fluid moving sort of against each other. So that gives you an expression like that. Um, anyway, that's all good. And then, um, 
there's another one here which involves the um allows dependence on thickness okay the horizontal velocity times the thickness this also produces order three dependence all right but we don't doesn't tell us anything too much about the physics there's a few other models that can do it friction and all kinds of stuff all right so in the time that remains and i'm um i've already succeeded in my goal of filling i'm gonna i am gonna go for 45 minutes bless me but um, it's a long time to listen to a talk on um, Zoom, that's for sure. So scattering. So I also think scattering is important. It dominates the process of, I believe, dominates fracture. I think it's really important for ice welding and all kinds of stuff, very dynamic processes. And it's been really useful for people to have a model for scattering and for how that affects and how much energy scattering removes just by its, the fact that it's, it's a very active process. So the key point just to really emphasize from scattering is it's got to change the wave momentum. And that's it. That's, that wave is barreling along and it has got a lot of momentum. That 10 second wave really wants to go in whatever the hell direction it's going in. It doesn't want to turn to the left or the right. It's like, a, um, it's like the University of Newcastle. It's just sort of moving in its own direction. Don't get in front of it and you're never going to be able to move it. So that ice flow has got to take that momentum and move it somewhere else. So it's got to really interact with it. It's got to be accelerated. It's got to kind of move and it's got to move counter to the wave in some way. So you've got to have a pretty big piece of ice to start to really have scattering. It's not, it's not something that will happen on the small scale. A whole lot of little pieces of ice is not going to change wave momentum. It's going to, it's going to um, eat a bit of energy up and as it slowly propagates that eat, eating of energy over thousands of kilometers is going to mount up. I just wanted to show this movie here, like maybe this is a complete indulgence, but I'll have a look at it. Hopefully Danny, um, it's from Danny DeMont. He might've shown it in his talk. Unfortunately, I had to do something. I couldn't go to his talk. This is a bit annoying this. Yeah, here it is here. I don't know if you've seen this and you can't tell me anyway and you write in the chat, but um, it's an amazing movie. I really loved it. Because you think nothing's happening, but there's actually this crack opening up here, which is kind of neat. Um, and then here we go, the ship comes rolling past. This is really interesting, relates to what Kevin said um, before. It's got, probably got nothing to do with my actual talk. But you can see the waves whizzing on in here. And you need to see if there's any overwash. Because, you know, Kevin was talking about that. And then the drone flies down with the ship. And the waves start propagating into this ice. It's quite a, this is a great movie. I don't know. I'm, I'm, if you've seen it before, then you'll just indulge me for showing it. I asked them to give me a copy of it, and I managed to work out how to compress it it's using some programs. I'm very proud of that. You can see it here, and I, I think there's a bit of overwash happening in here. Is, there, is that what we're seeing there, Kevin? I don't know. It's smashing the ice to pieces here. But you can see the waves propagating through, kind of moving through this and cracking it. Very dynamic process. This is what we really want to try and model. And it relates to a lot of stuff. It relates to ships and it also relates to wave breakup. The waves keep coming. The, the waves from behind keep coming and propagating through. The ice is very resistant, uh, very um, fragile. Okay, and we've already heard a lot of talks about that. There's no surprise how much it just breaks up. Um, all right, there we go. That's a bit of a um, picture of waves and ice breaking. So what I wanted to do was try to build a model for scattering that talked about the strength of scattering at the very least, how powerful the force is, um, and based on our and all of our complicated models that we developed for um, ice flows, and in particular based on our 3D models. So what I this is the second part of the work that came out of um, being in the um, INI. So um, holy moly, I love the fact that I said I was going to be short. It's always the most dangerous thing, isn't it? Like the person gets the speak just goes on and on. Um, all right, so this is our model for waves scattering by ice. Um, so it's a circular disk with this equation. And we've spent ages coming up with the maths of this, and there's been a whole lot of fun done with that. that people have taken this maths, all kinds of stuff. People have got, you know, floating circular disks, submerged circular disks, submerged circular disks as compression. People have said that they could use a submerged circular elastic disk as a wave power device and all kinds of stuff. And, and good luck with that. But this does give us a really strong measure of scattering, and it is in 3D, whereas a lot of the models have been done in um, 2D, which, you know, has, a, has, a, has a, uh, a bit of a problem with it. So this is a movie here. I'll show you these movies. This is kind of cool. It's my own version of Danny's movie. I'm not sure it's going to, um, it maybe not going to play here. Hoping it will play. Come on. 
There we go, brilliant. All right. It'll, the color will appear in a second. I think it's amazing how much energy is being used, or energy is the wrong word perhaps, but for the computer to run Zoom. But this is a wave interacting with the plate. This is actually what our model is. This is what we've modeled the ice as. Okay, the, the vertical scale is exaggerated just to, for effect, you know? So this plate is, you know, 100, 100 meters across, the wave amplitude is one. You can see the wave rippling around it, getting scattered off. This is the kind of modeling that we've done. This is, our, this is what, it's just a visualization of the equations basically. So you know what we're talking about. The waves are coming in and hitting it. Sure this one will play as well. Here we go. I'll have to wait again for it to play. Um, all right. I mean, hilarious. I love the fact that I forgot to tell you I was going to see, um, you know, give a, only give a half an hour talk. Remembered after five minutes, said it, and then I've talked for the full 45 minutes. It's going to pass into legend. This is a um, more floppy plate thinner, basically. So you can see it moves sort of more with the wave. But you can see how it's forcing against the waves and that just the elasticity of the plate is really important of the ice. I should say, it's perhaps ice is the, um, the, it's a floating elastic plate. And that's how, how we, um, I, I, when I published this, that's what I sold it as. I didn't try to make out it was ice. And Vernon, you can see how that, well, you could start to do this simulation and then you could start to crack it. And I love Vernon's story that um, the circle is very easy for us to solve. I love Vernon saying that, you know, he, meant he was breaking the circular ice into um, two circles. That seems perfectly reasonable to me, Vernon, so don't worry about that. I thought that was perfectly sensible. Well, let's see what happens here. All right, one last go. So they were long crested waves. That, that this is supposed to show a wave interacting with the poles. It, we might miss the punchline here by the time the computer's got enough. I should have bought one of those gaming PCs, you know, for so many reasons. Now I'm thinking, because I think it's just the graphics demand of Zoom, because it plays perfectly fine if I disconnected you guys. But this is both to show the wave hit, being hit by a pulse. So you can sort of create, instead of having a like plain test of wave, you can break it with much more of a shape and try and hit the flow with that. I don't know, it doesn't seem very dramatically different. It's more sort of circular. The, the wave's not sort of surrounding in quite the same way. It's just come in and hit it. And then it's actually created all these scattered waves that radiate out. So it's redirecting energy. There's completely energy conserving the system. All right. Here we go. So we're almost finished here. So this is what happens is you've got the, there's a 3D model, a 2D model, and there's a 2D average model, because the 2D model gets these weird resonances, and you can see that you can try and average them out, but the, the, this is showing you the uh, attenuation coefficient as a function of T, not as a function of period, uh, the function of omega, it should be K as a function of omega, right, but this, I've just plotted it the wrong way, but this is easier for people to see in physical units. So you can see the key takeaway from this is that the 3D model is a lot more complicated, doesn't really give a very different answer from the 2D, certainly not from the 2D average model. So we don't need to go to 3D probably. We've got a pretty good estimate of attenuation from 2D. So that, that's kind of cool. And, um, and that, that's good that story checks out because we wouldn't expect them to be very different, right? We know these, and the simpler models always do really well. They mightn't make us cooler pictures, but. And then if you compare the scattering with this um, attenuation here, you see that the scattering dies way too quickly. And then you, they're not, the curves aren't really very well related, maybe a little bit here with some of these um, measurements. This is the, um, don't ask what these measurements are, I've forgotten myself, but this is the one that, um, this is a recorrection of the ones that would, I showed you that would, came from that um, C state. And these are all those other measurements. But, um, what's important here is that the scattering will dominate at these short periods. If you've got short periods and big flows, they're getting whacked around and all kinds of stuff's happening. So you do have some effect of scattering. You've got to take this into account. All these measurements were made when the flows had all been fractured up long after that wave we saw from Danny Dumont had passed. All right. I don't know how much I need to say about this. Um, it's basically two, th two things to take away. One is that this power law fits perfectly with the dispersion relation, not with scattering. So that you've got some, you've got some kind of change to the wave number. You write down an equation for the wave number, take into account your physics, and that K will give you an imaginary part that'll give you energy. 
loss. And you can also just start trade with the energy loss and buy this law in a product I derived. You can calculate the power law relationship as well. Doesn't tell us what the physics is, unfortunately, because there's a lot of different ways we can obtain that, that power law. It tells us what the answer can't be though. And it tells us that, it, the main, that it's not a viscous layer. That's, it's not the viscosity inside that layer that's eating the energy. It's some other process. And then, um, um, yeah, and then I've added on to this, the um, done some scattering. In fact, and I've proposed that if you want to really model the attenuation, you should have scattering plus this other term. You should include that just fitted from data, that power law term. And, that'll, and that seems to give quite good results. Every time we use it, it seems to work quite well with the grid. Because, and probably because we've just fitted it to the experiments and in in most of the case, the experiments are what's dominating. And these are the two papers that I've mentioned here. One of them was published more recently, but they both came out of the, um, when I came back from the um, Isaac Newton Institute, I would just stay on a little bit longer. I had like four papers I had to get finished by the end of the year. This is one of them. And I didn't, I had managed to finish three of those papers. One of them still in the to-do list. After five years, it's starting to get a bit scary, but that's the case. All right, thanks a lot. And um, yeah, I've talked for, for well long enough. So thank you very much for listening to me and indulging me as well. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, now let's have some questions. Over here. Hello, Mike. It's Vernon here. I recognize that voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, just uh, really comments rather than questions. Uh, it strikes me that if you think about the what you call the, the viscous Greenhill model, the stuff that's been published on that is usually, and I'm not saying it's always this, the, the case, that the viscosity is dealt with by stuffing in an imaginary part to the complex, uh, to the elastic modulus, which means that there is a power law relationship which is occurring on the dis on the imaginary part as well as the non-imaginary part. So it shouldn't surprise us too much that we get these ridiculously high. Well, you, you, basically you've got you've got a d by the x to the four. It's going to yeah, out a exactly. to the four, and that's an omega to the eight. Yeah, so absolutely. Like so it yeah. it comes about because of the way the the viscosity is added to the dispersion relation. If you added it in some other way that wasn't the k to the four type relationship you wouldn't get that and that's why the robinson and palmer model works because it's just proportional to velocity dependent damping yeah exactly yeah yeah um but <clears throat> the other point i'd like to make is um with respect to scattering uh, there are observations that suggest that the directional spread that you get well, let me say first, suppose you have a collimated C coming into your marginal ice zone. There are observations that suggest that beginning at a high frequency and then moving to low frequency, the directional spread increases. Uh, and that is replicated by a scattering model. So I agree. I don't think you can dismiss That's, scattering. Um... That's a and that's a, that directional spreading is critical to um is critical to scattering. It's the only process that can you can yeah, explain directional absolutely. spreading is scattering. And if you don't have directional spreading, you don't have scattering. That's one hundred percent agree with that. And, and that, I think that and that there's experimental those, data to suggest that too. That, I mean, I know it was collected during MISEX, but it was it still did show with you know a fair amount of error error bar attached to it that you were getting increased directional spread, which was somewhat counterintuitive at the time, but it is explained by the scattering model. Well, I think it's also, yeah, I'm not convinced that there's directional spreading, but I'm not convinced there isn't, but it's, it's definitely know that the early way, you know, the early, say, this in the Wayboy experiments that were conducted recently at the, but early, the earliest of the recent ones, you know, because there's kind of a renaissance of them in the last 10 years or so, they didn't have a way of measuring directional spreading. So that's a, was a shortcoming for sure. They were only able to tell the, you know, they didn't, they couldn't tell the direction, which is just the way the wave boys were designed. And 
And so that may also have influence. It'll be interesting to know from the experimentalists what they say about that, That's for sure, to get them to work this out. And finally, sorry to hog the microphone. Um, it did occur to me during the first third of the talk that you hadn't listened to my talk. <laughs> <laughs> or Danny's. No, I hadn't. Danny, no. <laughs> because I, I said, actually, I said a lot of the things that you said um, prior to you saying it. So you'll be reassured that we both agree. <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, um, I, I did not. Um, but I would, I'll have to um, watch it. Yeah, so I guess you were also banging on about the fact that we don't know what's going on, being the key point. Hi, Mike, Danny Hello. speaking. Hello, Danny, yes, and thanks for that movie. Yeah. I hope you did show uh, that. No, I didn't show that. Okay, <laughs> so brilliant. We have a poster version, which is more static. So that's, uh, that's uh, good It's my movie, movie now, because I've uh, exactly. renamed it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you for, um, you know, keep puzzling us because it is a category uh, puzzling problems that CIS uh, posed to us. But uh, um, what are your thoughts about uh, possible interactions between scattering and dissipation? And I'm talking about maybe when scattering cause uh, the wave energy to transfer from long wavelengths to short wavelengths or low frequency to higher frequency and then got dissipated in a yeah, 100%. Wave. You, you understand that. So have yeah, you yeah. thought about that? And will you think about that over the next five years? Yeah, I think that is. And that's actually part of the um, part of that. When I calculated that coefficient, I should have said that one of the things I did is I sort of assumed that once the energy starts to get scattered, it's going to start bouncing around and some process will be eating that up. Because for sure, it's, 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 once you're scattering you're, you're kind of dissipating energy by the fact that you're moving it in different directions. As you say, you're converting it from one frequency to another, and all of that's going to lead to energy being lost, for sure. And that might explain why the directional spreading is not as strong, right, because of, of that interaction. And of course, we're never going to get the situation that you get, you're saying that those, you know, when those numerical experiments Vernon did, the wave propagated in forever, and it was no energy was dissipated. So you've got this very isotropic field. But in practice, the wave hasn't had that long to propagate and it's getting eaten by some process. So the scattering will be much weaker. The isotropy will be weaker, probably. Hi, Mike. It's Alberto. Nice toy. And I have a couple of comments or questions, open ended question. One is like, you discussed about the physical mechanism for the dissipation, right? And I think we've been a little bit guilty, especially when we go to the lab that we focus on one specific mechanism and we scale with those parameters in mind. And uh, I mean, one of the comments that I want to from you is like, do you think there is a good way to scale laboratory experiments to the field? Yeah, then, I think that is really important. Yeah, because I think you've got to think about what you're looking for as well. Yeah. Because I, I agree with that. Because I mean, that, I know that you did that recent work, which is um, published in Isopi journal. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've got <laughs> so not the place I definitely, not the first place I recommend publishing, but seems to the people have cited it, I noticed, which I was pleased about. But um, yeah, that was really interesting that experiment where you watched it decay and, you know, like then trying to, but try, but what is the process? What is the, what is the scaling factor of that that's going to be, you know, that you can scale to the field, you know, because. Because when you scale it up, the physical processes shift quite dramatically. I think there's a real issue. Yeah, and uh, just, yeah, okay, go on. Yeah, but yeah, I think if you that perhaps it's just enough to understand the experiment. Yeah. In the first instance, yeah. Yeah, because like uh, you mentioned the paper. I mean, if you go and scale the viscosity, you have to scale the experiments to scale the viscosity dissipation in a proper way, and. Uh, the other question I had, it was about the plots of the field measurements in the dissipation. And you mentioned, rightly so, that there is a huge scatter in the dissipation coefficient that you compute. And I, I couldn't miss to notice that some of the whisker went into negative values. So it basically means that some of the field data, they give wave growth instead of wave decay. Yeah, and we don't know whether that's because the process that the wave boys were seeing was totally non, you know, there's no stationarity because the wave field could be changing and it's, it's quite a, 
but 100%. Sometimes there's the wave energy, you know, midnight on March the 18th, it was greater 100 kilometers in than it was. Yeah, so it's, there's a huge scatter there. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Mike. Then, yeah. All right, I think uh, we can conclude the discussion there. Um, Mike, thanks again for your presentation. No worries. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Goodness. I wish I was there so much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we'll certainly miss you at the tea break, but we'll hope for next five years. Yeah. <laughs>